Where does fulvestrant then now fit in? Where does it fit into everybody's practice? Denise, where do you use fulvestrant now? So, I, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm somewhat mixed on where I'm using fulvestrant. I've looked at various of studies. I'd certainly say my first line treatment for endocrine um, positive patients in the metastatic setting is a CDK4-6 combination. And then I have moved um, fulvestrant into that setting for most of my patients, although I have to say we participated in the Trinity-1 trial that looked at um, adding ribocyclob after CDK4-6 inhibitor, either immediately if they've progressed or um, they could have had an interval chemotherapy and edit, um, added everolimus to that combination with exomustain. And so I think, you know, I'm looking to see, you know, from my experience on that trial, because it wasn't blinded, um, in, uh, we're in the data assessing phase, you know, patients did very well with adding everolimus, adding the CDK4-6 ribocyclib um, with exomustain. So I think that it's a time that we're really re-exploring what to do because of paradigm shift. So now where we've had a lot of data from Valero 2, that was not in the CDK naive population. So now how do we go back and look at everolimus in that patient setting? I think, you know, it's a time that I think we're kind of searching through using the clinical trials really to keep these patients moving forward so we can really understand what's the next best sequencing if there is going to be one. Any other comments, Carlos? Yeah, I think that, um, I think the, the Falcon study which showed uh, full vestrant being superior to an AI, for me tells me is that the way we should probably consider thinking uh, treating an ER positive tumor first is not with an estrogen deprivation, but with something that eliminates ER. Physically or functionally, think about, you know, because there's also ER in the, like an independent ER function. So to me, uh, what that, this, those data do is that stimulates me to, let's find a better CERD. A better than regulated. And there are some oral surge trials going yeah, on. Yeah, they're going on. And, yeah. and I agree with Carlos. <coughs> I think, in my mind, and again, this is very dynamic at this time because it's a time of paradigm shift, but in my mind, Fulbestran is the best uh, anti estrogen we have these days. And one of the principal, and the data is beginning to accumulate. I mean, the Falcon study to me was a big eye opener. So I tend to move it to first line whenever I can. So most people would think about fulvestrant and a CDK. Is that what we're saying as first-line therapy? Well, so kind of what I'm hearing. several of us have been saying that probably the better partner for a targeted therapy has been fulvestrant. Right. It's the backbone, I think. Yeah. So then you progress, say, on that. And so now what's the role of a varolimus? I mean, that brings us back to varolimus. You know, I guess it's called the old one, even though it was only well, in yeah. 2012. I mean, yeah. you know, it's so, not that so, old. Yeah, so, so let's remember one thing about varolimus. The Boleto 2 study that we presented the hazard ratio was 0.46. It's pretty good. It was pretty good. Now, I think uh, Verolimus had the issue and has the issue that it takes expertise uh, in how to use it because mucositis can be a rate limiting um, uh, toxicity and it requires people to be very careful. So I think that if you see physicians <coughs> that are used to use Everlimus, they, they do a great job, they don't get in trouble. Uh, it's all about making sure that you check mucositis early on. So these are patients that you don't call to clinic six weeks later, it's too late. You need to monitor them earlier. But I think it has a role clearly. Now, um, what happens with CDK4-6 is this after what happens, uh, it, it's a change in scenario, so, so we don't know the answer to this, but it does play a role, mm -hmm. and I use it all the time, uh, mostly in the second line setting, I think, and yeah. full best data also is coming along very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, so I use it, it quite a bit. I thought the precog study at San Antonio was very helpful, showing this improvement in PFS when you layer Everlimus on top of Fulvestrin. I will say one thing that's clinically somewhat relevant is, you know, most of us who use a lot of the drug are using dexamethasone, swish and spit solutions now that's been published in Lancet, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and significantly reduces grade three form mucositis to single digit amounts. But my observation since I've started using that is that I'm seeing more rash in the other side effects because yeah. the mucositis mm -hmm. usually appeared early uh -huh. and I would see these patients at two to three weeks mm. just to see how they're doing. But now with the swish and spit, I'm not seeing the mucositis. And so I've actually pushed the time that I see them back to about a month. They're usually coming in for their bone health agent anyway. But I'm convinced that I'm seeing more rash because before we would see the mucositis early, then we would dose reduce. And now we're preventing the mucositis and the patients are staying on the higher dose. So you just have to be aware. That's one thing that kind of fell off my radar screen was the rash. And now I, I 
I perceive, this is a, a single investigator study, is that we're seeing more of the rash because we're not dose reducing um, early because of the mucositis. Well, and I've always been a fan for dose reduction. I mean, I gotta tell you, I mean, you, you're Bolero too, you know it. I don't know why you guys picked 10, you know? Like, <laughs> you could have done five, and, you know, but not, I mean, we can't say that it's the FDA approved dose is 10 and you should start, but you know, on the other hand, I'm just not sure that 10 was necessary. I mean, is, what's your thoughts on that? I'm really curious. We have multiple examples in oncology in which the clinical trials were done on pushing the full dose. Capsidemic being an example. Right, another example. Um, you got it. Everolimus as well. So I think there is nothing wrong, actually, to be very, very eager to go down on the dose because the data between 10 and 5, I would agree with you, is totally unclear. And at the end of the day, the proportion of patients that drop to 5 uh, occurs in a very high number. So I would have, and I'd have a very low threshold to go down on the dose. Yeah, Kim, so when your patients get rest, do you drop to 5 then? So yeah, usually do. sometimes I'll drop to 7.5. It really depends on the grading of the toxicity. I'd like okay. to, to, just like with CAPE, I don't like to just drop it to the lowest level. I like to go down and then see. I do think, I agree with Jose, that you have to see these patients back. Yeah, you do. You can't, it's not, you know, just like we're learning with the CDK inhibitors, it's no different. You can't just let them run loose for two months yeah. because Usually they will. Usually have people have a two-week appointment after. Yeah, so somewhere between this. two to three weeks, although yeah. I might be pushing that back a little bit because I'm not seeing the mucositis. Right.